apologize for my tardiness. Today has been rather a peculiar transit day coming in from New Jersey, as I am no doubt you're all well aware. Uh, regrettably, I was not here in time to give the written text of my introduction to the library administrator, so I will introduce myself. Uh, I have the great honor of serving as the Grand Historian in the Grand Lodge of Free and, Accept Accept Blech, Free and Accepted Masons in New York. I also do have the great honor of being the Senior Deacon in the American Lodge of Research, which meets in this building. Uh, I have a doctorate in counseling psychology from New York University, and I have the great pleasure of serving this year as a visiting assistant professor at Hunter College CUNY, and I am an elected fellow of the American Psychological Association. Ladies, brethren, I come before you here to start a revolution. I am not exaggerating. This month marks my first public presentation on a subject my, the first public presentations that I'm making on a subject that is not only my passion, but that affects the life of every Freemason in the United States, and perhaps the world. When it comes to this subject, the stakes for our fraternity could not be higher. If this revolution is not successful, then American Freemasonry will become all but extinct during the lives of men whom we are now initiating. If this revolution is successful, then Freemasonry will become stronger and more influential in society than it has ever been. The golden age of Freemasonry is in front of us, either that or oblivion. Tonight, I will make three basic points. One, Freemasonry is rapidly approaching extinction, and the end may come faster than any of us might realize. Second, or B, there are five major reasons for the Masonic decline. And C, there are five sets of actions that we can take to bring about the reversal of the decline of Freemasonry, and beyond that, to bring about Masonry's strong resurgence. So, point A, where are we? Here is some unhappy news from the latest membership figures reported by the Masonic Service Association of North America, along with some census data and my own calculations. United States Masonic membership at year-end 2015 was the lowest it has ever been since the Masonic Service Association started keeping figures in 1924. During 2015, U.S. Grand Lodges on average saw a net loss of about 2.8% in membership compared to the previous year. Now that may not sound like a lot, but that has been the average annual net loss for each of the preceding 30 years as well. So this is not a statistical blip. During 2015, the average net loss seen in the United States increased tremendously to a total of 4.1% loss. We are not only bleeding membership, but it appears that the rate of bleeding is getting substantially worse. The rate of membership loss is even worse in the Grand Lodge of New York, which lost 7.5% of its members in a single year during 2015. And it's been even worse in the Grand Lodge of New Jersey, which lost a full 8% of its members during this period. I am indeed the Grand Historian. So let's talk a little history. Even as the United States population has steadily grown over the last 70 years, the proportion of adult U.S. males who are Masons has steadily fallen every year since 1954. Contrary to popular belief, the membership crisis 
started over a decade before the anti-establishment movements of the 1960s gained the attention of young Americans. In that banner year of 1954, Freemasons comprised almost 6.5% of the American male population. There was one Mason for every 15.4 adult U.S. males. Everyone knew who the Freemasons were. Now, Masons comprise less than 1% of the adult male population, and there's only one Mason for about every 100 or so adult males. Very few people know that Masons still exist. So where's this all going? An American born, an American male born on January 1st, 1995, would be 21 years old at present and eligible to petition for the degrees of Freemasonry in all the free and accepted Mason Grand Lodges of the United States this year. <coughs> this hypothetical candidate has a life expectancy of 82 years. What will Freemasonry look like in 2087 at the end of his life? If current trends continue, we will have slipped in nationwide membership from about 1.16 million members to about 150,000, a drop in membership of about 87% from what we have today. As far as I'm concerned, a drop in membership of almost 90% in, will mean that Freemasonry as we know it will long have ceased to exist. In other words, if these trends continue, we are now initiating the last generation of Freemasons in the United States. As the right worshipful Philip Hudson stated at the 2007 Grand Communication in Florida, and I quote, we are one generation away from extinction. Think what that would mean. We would no longer be providing initiatic experiences, nor the personal growth that those experiences can nurture. We would no longer exert a living, civilizing an influence in society at large. Our vaunted charities might continue if they have sufficiently large endowments, but otherwise they'll be gone too. How about the many quiet acts of local relief and charity that our lodges do? Without lodges to do them, these acts will not occur. But this projection is like the ghost of Christmas yet to come. It is a future that will be only if we continue on the path we are on. Which leads me to major point B. There are five major reasons for the Masonic decline. There are many mysteries within Freemasonry, but the reasons for its decline are not among them. First of all, in many lodges, masonry is not delivering what it promises. At present, the real reason for the membership loss is voluntary attrition. <coughs> Volun that is, voluntary demits from Freemasonry and dismissals from the fraternity because of non-payment of dues, which we often talk about as NPDs. And this is typically before someone's seventh year in Freemasonry. But why? Why do demits and NPDs actually exceed the number of initiations in many jurisdictions? I have a very straightforward explanation for this. In many lodges, Freemasonry just does not deliver what it promises. Why do men come to Freemasonry? Not for the sake of donating to charity, not even to give service. There are many opportunities for fellowship aside from Freemasonry. At this point in the 21st century, people come to Freemasonry primarily for the sake of their own self-culture and education. People come to Freemasonry in order to learn about the mystery of the universe and to improve themselves so as to better learn that mystery in the company of like-minded others. 
That's what people come to Freemasonry to find. A way to understand the big questions. A way to improve themselves so that they'll be able to handle the big answers. And a social context in which they can do that with like-minded brothers. This is what Masonry, with its centuries-long reputation and its impressive, impressive initiatory ceremonies, that's what it promises them. And then, so many lodges deliver business meetings with all the spiritual content of a phone bill. <laughs> this is not the kind of experience that will bring people back to the lodge month after month, year after year. A brother just introduced himself to me as I was walking in, saying that he'd been in the craft for over 60 years. God bless you. But I'm guessing that many, many an initiate will not stick around that long waiting for the promise to be delivered on. And I'm, I'm guessing that you were fortunate in that you did have that promise delivered on. <clears throat> I'd like to say something about that later on, if you don't mind. Later on. Okay. The result is, uh, who of you are MBAs? All right, we have a couple of people. We have two people willing to admit that they have MBA degrees. All right. How about MFA? <laughs> That's not what I'm talking about. <laughs> MBAs, you guys have a phrase these days to describe what happens when an organization, an organization fails to deliver what it promises. What it promises. It's a failure to deliver on what? The value proposition. Okay? And so people demit, or they just stop paying their dues and quietly disappear. Second major reason for the problem. In particular, Many lodges fail to deliver quality Masonic education. <clears throat> the value of Masonic education is all too often honored verbally without actually delivering it. When it is delivered in a lodge room, it is often given too little time, too little preparation to really have an impact, or it focuses on things that don't really change lives, like, dare I say it, famous Masons. Even worse, it seems that few lodges have an overall approach or framework for delivering Masonic education. Uh, so the brothers hear a hodgepodge of different kinds of topics with no overarching order or structure to, to them. In 2014, I conducted an online survey of Freemasons. Hundreds responded, mostly from the United States, and by far the single most important thing that they, happened to, that they wanted to see happen in Freemasonry was the widespread implementation of quality Masonic education. When we deliver poor Masonic education, when we do not deliver it at all, we undercut much of the reason that people became Masons in the first place. A lack of quality Masonic education in many lodges <coughs> is killing Freemasonry one NPD at a time. The third reason for the decline. Very few people today have an accurate idea about Freemasonry or even know that it exists. <clears throat> Within living memory, pretty much every adult in America knew that Freemasonry existed. As I said, in 1954, Freemasons comprised about 6.5% of the adult American male population, and there was one Mason for every 15.4 adult males in the country. Prominent clergy in the community were known to be Masons. Even today, one can sometimes find online the published sermons that they offered at Masonic events. That whole picture has changed today. As I mentioned, in 2016, Masons comprise less than 1% of adult American males. That's only one Mason for every 100 or so adult American males in the country. Hardly anyone knows that we still exist. The net result 
is that Masons have become close to invisible in society. One group of Masons in the American heartland, called the Knights of the North, described the loss of knowledge of the craft in the public consciousness in our day. I quote, in less than 100 years after the birth of the first Grand Lodge in 1717, virtually every man, woman, and child in the Western world knew who Freemasons were and what the order stood for. Yet, 60 years after World War II, fewer and fewer people in society knew what a Freemason was or that the fraternity still existed. End of quote. No wonder then that the right worshipful Philip A. Hudson stated this during his grand oration in Florida. I quote, the average person does not have a true concept of who we are or what we stand for. In today's time, would any worthy man want to become a member of a fraternity he knows nothing about? End of quote. But there's more. Fourth major problem, major reason for the decline. We may be bringing in some inappropriate candidates. Of those gentlemen whom we do initiate, we may be bringing in gentlemen who are not, in fact, interested in what Freemasonry is really about, which certainly includes self-discovery and self-improvement. Indeed, we may be bringing in gentlemen who are not actual gentlemen at all. The most worshipful Grand Master of Masons in New York, Jeffrey M. Williamson, has this to say in the current issue of the Empire State Mason Magazine, the fall 2016 issue. I quote, In recent times, a petition for membership was eagerly and hastily presented to any man who showed even the slightest interest in our fraternity. Prior to his acceptance, the prospect had little or no education as to what our expectations might be for him, or what his expectations might be for us." End of quote. This is not a system calculated to bring in the best. The, re the results are almost predictable. Some men who become Masons become easily bored, uh, even at the most dynamic lodges, simply because they're not that interested in personal growth in the first place. Even worse, as uh, most worshipful Williamson points out in that article, this process can even bring in charlatans and criminals into the lodge, weakening the entire craft. The fifth reason, anti-Masonic propaganda in the 21st century discourages the honest in heart from investigating Freemasonry. The Masonic Service Association has stated the following, and I quote, we believe that the public's perception and opinion of Freemasonry can be summarized briefly in the following ways. Confused, are the Masons a fraternity, a religious organization, or an alternative religion? Mistaken, maybe only grandfathers could be in such an old-fashioned <coughs> association as Freemasonry. Oblivious, people are not even aware that Masonry still exists. End of quote. As damaging as each of these public perceptions are to the survival of Freemasonry, there is a fourth perception shared by a sizable minority of the public that presents its own special challenges. I describe it this way. The Masonic Service uh, Association noted that people are confused, mistaken, or oblivious. I would add delusional. <laughs> Some people believe that Masonry is a satanic, devil-worshipping conspiracy bent on enslaving humanity. <laughs> on April 25th, 2016, I conducted a couple of quick online reviews. One, the, the top 100 web pages found in a Google search of the term Freemasonry, and 
the top 100 videos found by searching the same term on YouTube. Well, the, result, the results were quite troubling. One-fifth, 20% of the top-ranked web page results were clearly anti-Masonic in nature. Fully half, 51% of the top-ranked YouTube video results were clearly anti-Masonic in nature. Here are the titles of some representative examples of the anti-Masonic web pages. The aim of Freemasonry is the triumph of communism. <laughs> Freemasons, the silent destroyers. Deist religious cult. Freemasons exposed. The description of the web page was, the gods of the Freemasonry Lodge are Egyptian gods. Freemasonry. Midwife to an occult empire. <laughs> the, description, the description goes, evidence that the higher Masonic degrees conceal the true nature of Freemasonry as a satanic religion. So there you have it. Uh, Freemasonry is supposedly a satanic conspiracy built on, bent on totalitarian rule. If anything, these themes are picked up even more sharply in the anti-Masonic YouTube videos, of which these titles are representative. Join Freemasonry and lose your soul. Proof! <laughs> Secrets of Freemasonry found in Masonic books. It gets better. The description of this video goes, Lucifer is the god of Freemasonry. <laughs> and other facts written by high-ranking Masons in their own books that are found in libraries. <laughs> Let's go a little farther. The secret agenda of high-level Freemasonry. Illuminati, the Freemasonry, and Zionism, the master plan to rule the world. We're kind of hitting all bases there. Why won't celebrities tell their Illuminati Freemasonry secrets? Freemasonry, a Jewish, a Jewish Luciferian cult, a rare daring investigation. Baphomet is the god of Freemasonry. Freemasonry, the Masonic Lodge, and the Shriners are not compatible with biblical Christianity. This is a long one. Lucifer worshippers exposed, plotting soon world takeover, Illuminati, Jesuits, Freemasonry. The nine videos that I've just mentioned had a combined total of eight, almost eight, yeah, 804,000 views on the date of my review. Individual videos ranged from 5,500 to about 192,000 views. Some of the anti-Masonic videos in the YouTube Top 100 have had over one million views apiece. The number one ranked video on Freemasonry contends that the fraternity is an ongoing indoctrination into Satanism. This video alone has had over two million views, and it has a wonderful clickbaity title, Watch this before joining Freemasonry. <laughs> the upshot of all this is that when a potential candidate goes online to find out information about the fraternity, a substantial proportion of what he encounters will be not just misinformed inaccuracies, but melodramatic delusions of the most lurid sort. Should he look for online videos on the topic, which is the preferred method of the rising generation, the search for truth may be aborted at the very beginning because of the flood of highly developed but delusionally bizarre falsehoods about Freemasonry that are easily available on the internet. And to depart from my text, in my survey results, I had several individuals say that their families had seen such videos and had given them a great deal of hard time about becoming a Mason. And one can only imagine how many such 
men were not able then to become Masons without engendering a great deal of, they weren't willing to take the risk of engendering such hatred in their families. We must not tolerate this any longer. We must directly counter the grotesque and often sickening lies told about Freemasonry, lies that I believe keep many good men from the fraternity. And I have good reason to believe that it keeps good men from the fraternity because it kept me from the fraternity. My petition to a Masonic Lodge was put off by perhaps as much as 20 years as a result of reading the false accusations against Freemasonry advanced in the, by the notorious and late Stephen, Stephen King in his popular book, The Brotherhood. Sometimes I think what I could have accomplished as a Mason in those 20 years. We all should think about the many men who might otherwise have been truly great Masons had they not been led astray by anti-Masonry, which we have often abstained from responding to. These are serious problems, but they're not insoluble problems. There are things we can do to address or even solve these problems, and let's go into these solutions. My main point C is that there are five sets of actions that we can take to bring about the resurgence of Freemasonry. <laughs> the opportunity exists for us not just to reverse the decline, but to build Freemasonry into a state much stronger than it has ever been in. Doing this will have a great and positive effect upon millions of people and upon society as a whole. Now I will describe how we Freemasons can make that happen. To create the resurgence of Freemasonry, we must face five great tasks. Uh, let's look over the five tasks of the Masonic resurgence in an overview fashion. And because we're a society of symbolic builders, I describe these tasks in terms of five symbolic structures that we should build or repair. The first task, repair the temple. The first task of the Masonic resurgence is to repair the temple. By this, I mean that we must improve the lodge experience so that it better fulfills the promise that we make to initiates upon their initiation. The promise that Freemasonry will help them understand more about the great questions of life and that Masonry will help them become better human beings. If we improve the Lodge experience, this alone will largely solve our problems with retention and NPDs. If we do not refine the Lodge experience, almost nothing else we do will make a difference as Freemasonry heads towards extinction. Part of the first task requires us to rethink the way that we conduct the stated communication. I suggest that we make Masonic education the heart of the stated communication and set aside at least a rock bottom minimum of 20 minutes for it in each and every stated communication and place it early in the meeting to give it the emphasis and the time that it deserves. We can rearrange the way that we handle other large business to make that possible. Another aspect of the first task involves how we deal with our entered apprentices and fellow crafts. These brethren should be involved in Masonic education during the time of the Lodge's stated communication, even if it's outside the Lodge room. And Masonic education for these people needs to be much more than just catechism practice sessions. It should involve the exploration of the symbolism and philosophy of the initiations that they have already received. The Lodge system of education that uh, the lot okay. The Lodge system of Masonic education that many Grand Lodges have, including New York, should be used here. Another part of the first task involves the way we conduct our ritual initiations. I strongly recommend that the Chamber of Reflection be implemented. I see some nodding heads there. That it be implemented before every degree. The degree lectures may also be delivered by different brethren 
performing different sections from memory. Full-scale degree rehearsals from memory are a key to a rewarding initiatory experience. Another part of the first task involves integrating all brethren into the life of the Lodge. Every new Mason should have an official mentor for the first year or two of membership, after which that new Mason should become a mentor. Every active Mason, <coughs> Mason should have a Masonic job, so to speak, in the Lodge. Inactive Lodge members should receive a handwritten personal invitation to return from the officers of the Lodge. The Grand Lodge of New York has an excellent mentor program in place, the North Star Project. We should use this project, and other Grand Lodges may wish to obtain our materials to create or enhance their own program. We're New Yorkers. We're generous. We share. <laughs> Lodges should hold, should hold certain types of special events. One stated communication annually should be devoted to a ceremony of Masonic rededication in which Lodge members symbolically renew the obligations and receive the charges of the three degrees. In addition, I support the practice of opening the annual installation of Lodge officers to family and friends of Lodge members. Finally, the Lodge Trestle Board, the monthly newsletter, is often poorly used. Much can be done to make the Trestle Board a vehicle to help brethren have a more meaningful experience within the Lodge. <clears throat> the three main offices of a Lodge have badges of office that represent specific working tools. Each of these working tools has a symbolic significance. It would help Lodge members to see a significant message about that symbolism from each of these officers in every issue of the trestle board. For example, an officer might quote from a, a worthwhile Masonic book on the, the theme of the symbol of the officer's office, and then apply these ideas to the situation of the sp this particular lodge today. This would, these would be worthwhile messages indeed. <clears throat> the second task of the Masonic Resurgence. Build the house of learning. By this, I mean that we need to conduct proper Masonic education in the Lodge. I've said that the heart of every stated communication should be a substantial period of time devoted to a session of Masonic education, but that Masonic education should be part of an overall solid plan. It should be well prepared and well presented. Now, in terms of what you present, at the Grand Lodge of New York, the uh, Lodge System of Masonic Education is an excellent place to start. At my own, the School of Freemasonry online, uh, we offer a course in how to prepare and deliver a high quality session of Masonic Education. And part of this course involves a discussion on how to select a topic for a lesson or a talk. Now, the third task of the Masonic Resurgence is to build the lighthouse. By this I mean that we should tell the world about Freemasonry. As things stand today, most of the public either does not even know that Freemasonry still exists, or they have inaccurate, even bizarre notions about who we are and what we do. In this context, telling the public that we exist who we really are, what we really stand for, is not only not a violation of Masonic ethics, it is necessary to fulfill the purposes of Freemasonry. So how do we accomplish the third task? Here are some ideas. Each individual lodge should have an open house annually. This open house may include both displays and formal presentations, 
such as a lecture about what Freemasonry is, what it is not, and so forth. A district deputy grandmaster can coordinate the open houses for the entire district so that they're spaced throughout the year, and this will give Masons in the district several different occasions in which they can invite family and friends to learn about Freemasonry. A Grand Master, I'm sensitive to the fact that this video will be seen not only around the country but even around the world, so let me speak to those Grand Masters. A Grand Master can direct open houses throughout the jurisdiction so that each district has some lodge offering an open house, at least monthly or quarterly. Keep in mind that none of this is recruitment, but no one can or will join a fraternity that he does not know exists or that he does not understand. The fourth task, repair the Western Gate. I don't just mean look well to the Western Gate. I don't just mean guard it well. I mean fix it. The fourth task of the Masonic resurgence is to repair the Western Gate. By this I mean that the Lodge Neal needs to deal properly with people who are prospects, who are interested in Freemasonry, and with actual petitioners, and with candidates. It is wise to require a person to attend Lodge events outside the stated communication for a certain number of events over several months before this person is even permitted to file a petition. During this time, the Lodge should take care to explain to the this person exactly what Freemasonry is really about, a fierce commitment to personal moral improvement, perhaps in a private conversation, or even a pre-petitioner class. It's before this person is allowed to submit a petition. Each lodge needs to explicitly define what it is looking for in a would-be petitioner. This should be more than the very minimal requirements of being male, holding belief in a supreme being, being of an appropriate age, and being able to gather people as character references. Before one is someone is permitted to submit a, a petition, they already should have demonstrated a commitment to inner development and self-improvement. After submitting a petition, but before initiation, a petitioner should continue to attend Lodge events aside from the stated communication. This would be a good time to prepare the petitioner for initiation through an explanation of the mental, even spiritual, preparation that he should undergo in order to be better prepared for the initiation experience. Candidates should receive in advance direction regarding what they should do while in the chamber of reflection. Of course, this advice presumes that they have such an experience, which they should, and before each degree as well. Now, the fifth task of the Masonic re resurgence <coughs> is to build the guard tower. By this, I mean that we should defend Freemasonry boldly and in public. Freemasons have long made it a practice not to respond to aspersions cast upon the fraternity, and this practice dates back to Anderson's Constitutions of the Freemasons in the early 18th century. But Anderson never anticipated the bizarre turn that anti-Masons would take three centuries later in our day when millions of people believe that devil-worshipping Freemasons plot to take over the world on behalf of Satan, his horde of demon minions, and a high elite of shape-shifting reptilian space aliens. <laughs> you can't make this up. Millions, uh, I am not exaggerating when I say that millions of people believe such insanity. When we do not respond to such allegations, this makes it appear that we cannot respond. Remember the principle of the English common law. Silence is assent. So, 
how might Masons go about the task of defending the fraternity? Here are some ideas. A portion of every lodge open house may be devoted to correcting misinformation about Freemasonry. Individual Masons may respond to misinformation about Freemasonry as found on the internet. Lodges and Grand Lodges may devote pages of their websites to correcting misinformation and rumors about Freemasonry. I see very few such web pages that do this. These are the five tasks of the Masonic resurgence. If we ignore them and maintain the status quo, then Freemasonry will likely continue its slide towards extinction. But if we engage these tasks with our might, Freemasonry shall thrive. Let the revolution begin. Let history record that the resurgence of Freemasonry began in earnest in the Grand Lodge of New York in September of 2016. Viva la revolucion! Viva! Viva la resurgimiento! Long live the resurgence of Freemasonry. Amen! Amen.